Okay. Hello, everybody. Great uh, to see such an attendance. I'm, I'm uh, delighted about the interest. Today we have a really nice little um, opportunity to have one of our PhD students, Isaac Boer, to uh, give sort of a live coding session um, to work with Python and satellite data. So this is not your usual webinar uh, of slides and presentation, but you might as well um, learn yourself some coding skills. Um, and for that, I think we can get ready to start. Isaac, you okay? Yes, I am ready. Yeah, we can hear you well. This is very good. Okay. Um, then I'll give the floor to you, Isaac. All right. Welcome to today's session of Tattoo Geocode. Um, this community is just about helping each other get up to speed with modern technology in geospatial science. And today I'll be taking you to um, some skills on how to use Python on remote sensing data. So as Alex mentioned, my name is Isaac. I'm a PhD student at University of Tartu, the geography department, and my research is based on using remote sensing to study urban climates. So without much ado, I'll just switch to the notebook and we'll get started. But before then, I would like you to participate in this um, pool I made, just to know how deep I should go with some of these technical stuff. So I'll place the link to the pool in the chat for everyone to give me some answers. So you first go to menti.com and then you put in this code right here. I'll also share my screen so we can have a look at the live votes. So the first question is just about telling us what your proficiency is when it comes to Python programming. And I can see most of us are somewhere in the middle and there's only one pro amongst us. About seven to one or two pros. Okay, so we then move on to the next slide. Um, this is more about Python with remote sensing data. Oh, yes, no, two to one, okay, three years. Oh, even, even again. All right, cool. So it looks like we have a, a balanced group here. Yeah, so it's going to be fun. And I think we will get some inputs from some of the pros here and also people who use the um, remote sensing and Python together. I mean, remote sensing data and Python. All right. So let's go to the main business now. And I'll drop another link in the, in the chat 
where we'll pick our notebooks from and then we'll get started. So if you would like to go through the notebook from your end while I also go through the live session, this link right here in the chat. Isaac, can I quickly don't take this link, take the link directly from the from the GitHub from, from you or the the link that you copy from there because this is already the spawned kernel if i'm not mistaken oh yeah sorry about that that is your kernel yeah. do you know which one i mean yeah So you should take the link I just posted, the most current one, and yeah, that should be yeah, it should be the one, yeah. So if you have any troubles, you can let me know so I could um, resend it just in case. But the last one should do the job. And then I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. All right. Are we all good with the link? Can I see uh, a thumbs up if we are good with the link? All right, so we'll get started now. So I'll start off with a brief introduction on what land surface temperature or LST is and what we should expect in this workshop. Some of the libraries we are going to use and also the data we'll be using. So this workshop aims at generating land surface temperature and other relevant products like NDVI, surface emissivity, and fractional vegetation cover for assessing urban climates or urban heat islands from Landsat 8. Uh, we will use the city of Tallinn, that is Estonia's capital, as our study area. And now the image we'll be using was acquired on the 27th of July in 2018. And this day is also part of a series of um, warm days or heat wave in 2018. Now LSD is a widely used parameter to assess the impact of heat waves. So this is one application of LST. Now you may want to know what LST is. It is essentially the skin temperature of land surface, which is estimated from top of the atmosphere brightness temperature. I'll talk more about this uh, brightness temperature as we proceed. Now, there are several algorithms to do the calculation from LSD, some of which are the split window, the dual angle, and the single channel. But for this workshop, we'll be using the single channel algorithm. So our data comes from Landsat 8, and we have the several bands in Landsat, but for this workshop, we just limited to these um, four bands. That's the green, the red, the near infrared, and also the thermal band. Now the green, red, and near infrared are coming from the Landsat collection too and they are already processed to surface reflectance, so we don't need to do any pre-processing on them. But the thermal band, for the purpose of this algorithm, comes from Landsat Collection 1, 
So we would have to do a little bit of pre-processing. And we also have the one kilometer population grids from the Mamet Estonian um, board, land board. And that is also used by the Estonian statistical services for population purposes. So our main libraries will be intake, Rasta IO, FPI, NumPy, GeoPandas, Rasta Stats, GeoCube, and Matplotlib. Um, as we proceed, I'll give you a brief introduction on the libraries and what they do. And those will be our general workflow. So essentially, we have two main parts to derive the land surface temperature from Landsat imagery, and one part will deal with the red and near infrared bands. We'll calculate the NDVI and calculate the fractional vegetation cover, and then N on that side with the land surface emissivity. On the other hand, we'll have the thermal band. We'll calculate the at sensor radiance, the brightness temperature, and also compute some constants using Plagg's uh, functions. And then in the middle, we we'll have the atmospheric functions, which will estimate from Motron measurements. And then finally, we have our land surface temperature. So by way of expectation, by the end of this workshop, we should have a one kilometer graded map of land surface temperature for the city of Tallinn and also a little data cube of the land surface temperature and then the NDVI. Now, um, quick information, your kernel in the binder may die. And in that case, you just need to um, go back and then get in there again. You could also give uh, it a shot by restarting your um, kernel. Okay, so I have a backup here while we wait on my local, which is exactly the same thing, and we could start off with that. Okay, I'm good to go now, so we can still use this. And yeah, okay, cool. So the first thing to do is to import the needed packages or the libraries. So over here in this cell, I just, um, we import our essential library. So we have the intake. This is purposely for calling the data we need into the notebook. And we have NumPy and Pandas. NumPy will help us do the mathematical operations on the matrices of the images we have. And Pandas will help us um, manage our data frame. Now, Rasta IO is uh, one of the popular libraries for handling Rasta data in Python. So we we'll need that as well. And we also have a GeoPandas, which is Pandas specifically made for spatial data. We would also import um, EarthPy here. This is also for both Rasta and vector data. And it is also built on Rasta IO and GeoPandas. And we also import the EarthPy plot, which is built on Matplotlib. And then we have the GeoCube, which is built on Rasta IO and then data cube to export our data. And we'll do a little bit of sampling. So we'll need the zonal stats from raster stats. And for our transformation, we would use um, a find. We'd also do some plotting. So we'd have to bring in matplotlib and also matplotlib colors for our visualization. Now we'd want to suppress the warnings that comes from Python. So we we'll just do this as a check to keep the one in sub bay. So the relevant data for this exercise can be found here. 
all the full bands are there. You can have a look at it, at it uh, after this um, session. But for this uh, workshop, we just have a subset of the image. So this is the false composite image of the Landsat scene we'll be working on. And you can find our study area for those of you who don't know where Tallinn is. Yeah, Tallinn is here, and that is the Gulf of Finland, and Helsinki is on the other side. So when you go to the download portal for Landsat 8, this is what you are likely to see. But to keep um, our, our work within the resources we have for Binder, we just have a subset of that to do our workshop. So let's get started by calling in our data. So on GitHub, where we have the main repo, there is a file with this name, which is the catalog and has um, access to all the data. So I'll just run my first cell. That is where I call all the libraries. And then I'll run this. Now I say the catalog is intake, open this catalog, and then list the catalog. So this list method provides us um, with the information of what sort of data we have in the catalog. So in this catalog, we have the atmospheric parameters, we have the grids, and we also have the stack bands. So all the four bands I mentioned earlier are in this stack band. Now we'll take, uh, we'll access the stack bands in the catalog and have an overview of what is in there and also fetch the individual bands we we'll need. So around the cell now, this might take a while. So we have to be a little bit patient. So the line of code is stack is equal to cut, which is the catalog dot stack bands dot read. Now with intake, you pass your data into your catalog and also specify a driver. Now this driver is what you expect intake to open your data with. So in this case, we are using Rasta IO or XRA Rasta IO. So by calling read or the method read, we have the native um, package doing the opening for us. So it opens the stack as um, an XRA data because we specify the driver as Rasta IO or XRA Rasta IO. And this is how it looks like. So we have our array, all four bands in there. And then we also have the metadata. So like the transformation, the coordinates reference system, the resolution, the no data values, the scales, the offsets, and what have you. But we would need individual bands to do the whiting. So we'd have to select them by indexing. And just as um, any array or list, the indexing starts from zero. So our band four is index one because the bands are arranged in green, red, near infrared. So green is actually zero, red is one, near infrared is two, and then the thermal band is three. So over here, I declare these variables band four, band five, and band 10. So B4, B5, and B10. And then we'll read them as NumPy arrays. So we call NumPy array stack, and then we pass the position or the index to it. So I'll go ahead and run the cell now. And then boom, we have something in there. We can go ahead and say, have a quick look at what band four is. And then, yeah, so it's um, simple NumPy array or usual NumPy array. Now we'll do the same for the other data sets in the catalog. So we had the grids, we had the 
atmospheric functions, and we also had the stack bands. Now we've gone through the stack bands. Let's look at what we have in the grid. So I call the cuts. I say read the grids, and then we have a geodata frame. So the grids is just a one column data frame where we have the IDs and also the property, which is the um, geometry. We'll do the same. Let's have a quick look at how the grids are. So this is a geopandas object, so we can plot. It has the attribute plot. So we say, okay, grids.boundary.plots. And this is how our grid looks like. You notice here we have some scientific notations for the grids, and we will um, go through how to deal with stuff like this in our plots in the final bit. So you don't have to worry about the looks of the plots now. Now let us take a look at the atmospheric parameters, which is a text file in the catalog. And by calling read, it actually does the read lines um, method for text files. So we see we have a band average atmospheric um, transmission, and that is the value, the upwelling radians, and also the downwelling radians. We will need this to compute our atmospheric parameters for the land surface temperature calculations. Now, since we'll be doing a lot of visualization, we would want to have our own color scheme to show our parameters. And um, from a cartographic point of view, there are certain colors that are more appropriate to show temperature and also show vegetation. So I put a set of colors in here. And over here, we use the matplotlib linear segment color map method. So this method just works like you pass a list of colors, essentially from low to high to the method, and then it builds a color map for you. So over here, we have one for the land surface temperature. We also have one for NDVI, and then I created one OPC map. You could use it for any of the intermediate um, results. So I'll run that cell now. So now we have all the needed data. We've set our color scheme so we can proceed with the main business. And the first one will be to calculate the NDVI or the normalized difference vegetation index. And this is arguably the most used vegetation index in remote sensing. And since the 60s, researchers have used data from red and near infrared light to estimate NDVI. Typically, NDVI values range from negative one to positive one, where negative values will signify um, bare lands, while positive values signify vegetative surfaces. For urban regions, you will have positive values, but not as high as one, usually less than 0 0.5. Now, to calculate NDVI, you need the near infrared and the red band. And the formula for calculating NDVI is given here. That's the near infrared minus the red divided by the near infrared plus the red. And for Landsat 8, the red band is band four, and then the near infrared band is band five. So we'll write a simple equation here. Say our NDVI is band five, and we'll force it or let Python understand that you have to make the values float. So band five as a float minus band four as a float divided by band five plus five. So let's go on and run this cell. So now we have our NDVI calculated and it just comes out as an array. With this array, you can't make much sense of it. So 
it will be wise to make a plot, a simple plot. So we'll go ahead and then visualize with edpy.plot. Now, as I mentioned, edpy.plot is built on matplotlib, and it makes it, uh, it's more of a simple way to plot spatial stuff without defining a lot of um, parameters. So here I call ep.plot because we imported that as ep. And then I say plot bands. I provide the NDVI or the array. I define the CMAP, that is the NDVI CMAP we created earlier. And I also say um, set the minimum value to negative 0.2 and then maximum one. And these values are coming from previous runs, so you can just use them like that, or you can also set them to negative one and then one. So let's run the plot. So we have our first um, intermediate results here. And as you can see, I would zoom out a bit. So we can have a full picture here. So this is Lake Ulemiste, which is a water body. So as I mentioned, water bodies usually have negative values for NDVI. And you can see it is somewhere negative 0 0.2. And in the Gulf of Finland, you also have really low values. And then the Delta area or the city of Tallinn, you will have positive values, but not as high as these uh, green patches or the forest areas uh, along the coast here, where essentially no one lives there. So you have higher values. So this is our first plot. And if you've been able to get to this stage in your binder, then doubly, we can make progress. Uh, feel free to drop a question in the chat. I'll be keeping tabs on, on that as well. Or you can just uh, interrupt by unmuting yourself and drawing my attention. Okay, so now we have our NDVI and we can make progress. We need the fractional vegetation cover um, to calculate what we call the emissivity. Now the fractional vegetation cover is essentially the ratio of vertical projected area of vegetation or what percentage of an area is covered by vegetation. And this um, controls the transpiration, photosynthesis, global climate changes, and other terrestrial processes. Now, to calculate um, fractional vegetation cover, we we'll use this formula. Of course, there are other ways of calculating that, but to do that, we we'll use the NDVI and we we'll use this relationship. That is the NDVI of a place minus the NDVI of soil divided by the NDVI of vegetation plus soil. Ideally, we would have a land use map to extract these values, but we don't have. So we'll use standard um, values for soil and then vegetation. And there's a reference to that here. So the NDVI of soil is given as 0 0.2, while the NDVI of vegetation here is given as 0 0.5. So in this cell, we'll put it into the expression. So we take the NDVI we calculated from the previous step and then run this expression. So this will perform a cell-wise or yeah, cell-wise operation. So each value in the NDVI image or array it does this operation. It takes two from this value and then divide by the results of this value. So let us go ahead and run that. And that is done. So again, we'll want to have a look at what 
the fractional vegetation cover S for our study area. Again, we call epplots.bands, we pass the array and also define a C map. In this case, I'll be using the NDVI C map and also V min or V max. You can do without this um, EP plot would automatically scale and then do the plotting. But as I said, I've already tried this and then I would recommend to use these values. So let's check it out. All right, so we have our fractional vegetation cover and you can tell where we have a lot of vegetation and where we don't have. And this is also similar to the NDVI map. So you don't really get a lot of information um, visually as opposed to, I mean, when you compare the NDVI and this, you don't get any new information. But then of course the values are different. Then we will need this in the following steps to do our calculations. So now we come to an important parameter in estimating land surface temperature, which is the land surface emissivity. Now, the emissivity of a material, I'll make this a little bigger for us. Now, the emissivity of a material is the material's relative ability to emit radiation. Now, the strength of the energy emitted depends on both the temperature of the surface and how efficiently it can emit radiation. So this tells us that this is an important parameter to determine the temperature of a surface. Now, most um, natural edge surfaces um, range between 0 0.6 to 1 in terms of emissivity but surfaces with emissivities less than 0.85 are typically restricted to desert and semi-arid areas. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any desert in Tallinn, at least not yet. So we may not see values like this, but vegetation, water, and ice have higher emissivities above 0.95 in the thermal infrared wavelength. And this information is coming from NASA. You can check out this link here for more information on land surface emissivity. Now to estimate the land surface emissivity of mixed pixels, um, Sobrino suggested this um, equation here. So the emissivity is equal to the emissivity of soil um, times one minus the fractional vegetation cover, which we just calculated plus the product of the emissivity of vegetation and the fractional vegetation cover. So ES or epsilon subscript S is the emissivity for soil and epsilon subscript V is that for vegetation. And again, we also have default or standard values for emissivity for soil and also for vegetation. And that is here on this line. So 0 0.97 for soil and then 0 0.99 for vegetation. So to calculate this, we'll go through the NDVI array and then check if the NDVI value is less than 0 0.2, that is a threshold for bare soils and then assign the value. If it's not, and it is greater than 0 0.5, we would assign it the emissivity for vegetative surfaces. And if it's in between, then we apply the expression or the equation for mixed pixels. So in this cell, we, um, do that calculation and we'll do that in a for loop since we'll be um, virtually walking through the NDVI image. So I'll first um, create an empty list here 
and then call my for loop. So for each row in the range of the length of the NDVI, so the length of the NDVI is just the length of the array. We work on each row and I say, okay, create another empty list. That's the emissivity of the row, which we will call M row. And then for each value in the range of the length of the row, let's do this. So now if the NDVI on that row at this point, so each value is none or no data, put in the M row, no data or MP9, because there's no data there, there's nothing to calculate. However, if the value is less or equal to 0 0.2, then we consider it as bare soil, append 0 0.97. That is the emissivity for bare soils. Else, if the value is greater or equal to 0 0.5, then we append 0 0.99, which will be the emissivity for vegetative surfaces. And if it's in between, then we apply the equation for mixed pixels. Yeah. So essentially, this is what we'll be doing for each row within the NDVI. Now here we'll also pick the corresponding value from the fractional vegetation cover. So the same index and also the same um, row index. So it's more of a pixel wise or positional operation here. Another way to do this will be to start off by creating a NumPy array of the same dimension and then doing the calculation. But this actually is a, a breakdown of what your regular GIS software will be doing on the back end. And it's more of a step-by-step -step process. So in the end, we append the row to the Emmy row. So this becomes, this Emmy row becomes a list of lists which is just essentially um, a simple NumPy array. And in the end, we'll just declare another variable and say take it or convert it to a NumPy array from a list of lists or a nested list to a NumPy array. So we'll go ahead and run this cell now. And yeah, it, it will take a while. We will wait and yeah, it's done. So let's have a look at our emissivity. Okay, so as expected, we have values ranging from 0 0.97 to 0 0.99 because we don't have any deserts or we don't have any massive bare lands in Tallinn, but you see the water bodies as the Gulf of Finland and the Lake Ulamiste having um, low emissivities. So now we are down with the left-hand side. I'll just go back to our workflow. We are done with this part of the workflow, and now we'll move on to the thermal processing. So let's get started with the thermal processing. Now, the formula for calculating land surface temperature is this really nice formula with a lot of Greek letters. Now, to do that, we need the brightness temperature. We also need the top of the atmosphere radiance. And then we also need the 
atmospheric function. So these are the atmospheric functions. And then this is the top of the atmosphere brightness temperature. So I, I explain these uh, functions here. So we have uh, lambda and gamma, or delta and gamma, sorry, which are Planck's functions. We'll go through how to derive these functions. The emissivity, the atmospheric functions, and also the top of the atmosphere radiance. So the first thing we need to do is to convert the raw data from band 10 to top of the atmosphere radiance. And we do that by using this expression. As we did for the NDVI, we will tell Python to consider this band as a float and then do the multiplication. Now this value is coming from the metadata and this is a constant for the thermal band of Landsat 8. So I have a comment in here. Supposing you are using Landsat 7 or 5, or in future you are using Landsat 9, you would have to look up these multiplicative constant and also the additive constant in the metadata. Now in the data repo I shared in this notebook, you'll also find the metadata and you can always make reference to that. So let's go ahead and get our top of the atmosphere radiance. Now that is done. We also, as I mentioned, we also need the brightness temperature and we need to calculate these two parameters based on Planck's function, that's the delta and gamma. Now to calculate the brightness temperature, we will need two constants, which you can also find in the metadata. That is K1 and then K2. I've already put them in here, so you don't need to go and make reference to the metadata. And also the delta and gamma, we need the brightness temperature and also the top of the atmosphere. And that is why we need to calculate the top of the atmosphere first. So now we'll go ahead and calculate the brightness temperature and we'll just follow the formula above. And over here, the brightness temperature or the measurements on Landsat is done in Kelvin, but we would want to have our values in degrees Celsius. So from the onset, we would convert all the Kelvin um, values to degrees Celsius by doing this subtraction here. That is minus 273.15. So this part of the equation converts the top of atmosphere to brightness temperature. And then when we are done, we take out the um, value to reduce it to degrees Celsius or to convert it to degrees Celsius. So that is what this equation will be doing. And then we'll also use the opportunity to just go ahead and calculate our gamma and also delta. And over here, it's the square of the brightness temperature. So Bt times Bt here. And then the constant times the top of the atmosphere, that's the K2, which you can also find in the metadata. And we'll do the same for delta following the expression here. So let's go ahead and run this cell. So our calculation is done. And then we move on to calculate the atmospheric parameters. Now, to, to do these um, land surface temperature calculations, you need the upwelling and downwelling radiation uh, measurements. This will help you to reduce from the brightness temperature, which is the temperature at the sensor to the skin temperature. So classically, people did atmospheric sounding 
at various locations to get those variables. But now you don't have to do that if you can't go to the field and do the calculation. There's an online calculator here in this link. You just have to go there and input the date of your image and also the latitude and then the longitude. So you say working in Tallinn, you have um, the last longs of Tallinn. You also know the date you the date of the image you downloaded from Landsat because you find that in the metadata. And then you have the time of acquisition. These are the three parameters you need to do the calculation. So the parameters W1, let's just call it W1, W2, and W3 or Psi. So Psi1 is the inverse of the um, transmission, which is here, atmospheric transmissivity. And then Psi2 is given by this expression and Psi3 is given by this expression. So I prepared this in a text file, which we saw earlier in our catalog. If you have forgotten how it looks like, we can still have a second look at it. And this is how it looks like. So the transmission, the upwelling radiance, and also the downwelling radiance. So we'll do a, lot of, uh, a little bit of strain operation here. This is basic um, Python. We go through each element. It comes out as a list, so we pick by indexing each element, do some stripping. We first find the colon for each element and do some stripping and slicing to get these values. And then we move on to the calculation based on the formula in the previous cell. And then we'll do a check to see if our values, what we extracted from the objects in the list is exactly what we need. So I'll go ahead and run this cell. So we expected our atmospheric transmission to be 0 0.5, and that is what we have. Our upwelling radiance to be 2.82, and that is what we have. And then the downwelling radiance to be 4.41, and that is what we have. So we are good to go. Now, up until now, we've just derived the parameters needed to calculate the LST. So now we have the delta, we have the gamma, we have the emissivity from the previous step, we have the top of atmosphere radiance, and we also have the three atmospheric functions. So now we can proceed to do the calculations. So LST is equal to gamma. In here, we have the inverse of emissivity times the product of the first atmospheric function and the top of atmosphere radiance plus the second atmospheric function, and then all that plus the third, and then plus the delta. So let's go ahead and run that. So now that is done. So we now come back to plot. Let's have a look at what our LST looks like. So again, we call EP.plotsBands, and then we pass the array LST, and then our CMAP is LST CMAP from what we created earlier. And then I say set the scale to false, and then V minimum and then V max. You can call these, um, define these parameters based on expert knowledge. At least I've been in Estonia for a while 
and worked on LSD data for Estonia in a while. So I can say 15 and also VMAX. Otherwise, you could just leave it for ep.plot to make a decision for you. So let's go ahead and run that. So this is what I have here. We have the water bodies having um, relatively cooler temperatures here, like all them this time also the sea, and then the built up areas having warmer temperatures. So we have our LST, we have our NDVI. Now what next? Ideally, you wouldn't give this plot to your clients or your employer or put this to your funding agency because it's not nice. We have uh, some no data region here and then we are only interested in talent, which covers about this area. So we would want to have a, a nice presentation for our clients or your research funding agency. And that is where most of the work lies. Or oh, that is what most people are interested in. So we we'll extract the LSC and then the NDVI to our population grids. Do you have a question, Alex? Okay. So we we'll extract the LSC and then the NDVI to our population grids which are just uh, one kilometer grids. So to do that, we'll perform zonal statistics to get a mean because these grids are one kilometer, but our images, our Landsat images come in 30 by 30 meters. So for each grid, we have a number of Landsat pixels in there. So we'll do a zonal statistics to find the mean land surface temperature and also the mean NDVI for each grade. Now, before we get started, these are just arrays. Our LST and then the NDVI are just arrays. They don't have any spatial information, but we need a spatial information to do the zonal statistics. So I'll go up back to the stack where we see the metadata. So we have the transform, essentially the bounds of the image and also the resolution. We will pick that attribute before we get started with the extraction. Yeah. So I say T2, this just means the transformation with a capital T as a topo stack dot transform. So I run that and then we just have exactly what we saw earlier. Now we'll use the affine method to create the transformation for ourselves for the extraction. Now you can either copy this and paste in the affine method or you can access each of them by using indexing. Now copying is simple, but you may change or clip the data and then you may copy the wrong or you may just have the wrong uh, bounds or the transformation, wrong transformation info from your previous notebook and then you may run into trouble. So it will be nice to just have this index and tuple in the same order and you pass that to the affine method. So you are always safe because it just picks everything from your previous um, variable into the next one. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then, yeah, so this is how our affine looks like. So now we can go ahead and do the extraction. And for that, we'll use the zonal statistics from the package raster stats. So I define a variable, say sampled NDVI is equal to the zonal stats. 
Now I need the grids or the polygons. So I call my grids. And then my array or my input raster, in this case, is the NDVI. Now I tell the zonal stats what kind of statistics I need. And as I mentioned, you want to have the mean NDVI per grid. So I say use mean. Now I tell it that I want my output as a GeoJSON. And that is why we also need the affine because GeoJSON is a geo object. So you need some special parameters to be defined. So we call our affine and say use affine or use trans as the affine for your calculation. Now this um, second code here is essentially the same thing, but here we put in the LST as the input raster or the array, and then also calculate the mean. We want uh, GeoJSON as the output, and then we want affine transformation from our previous one. So I run the cell now. And then we're good to go. What up it for me? So let's have a quick look at what our sample LST looks like. So this is a geo JSON with a lot of uh, info. But to make it easy to work with, we'll convert it to a geo data frame using geo pandas. So in this cell, we would say, Geo data frame from the features. So we pass the GeoJSON file from the previous step to this method, and we'll call this um, Geo data frame sampled NDVI GDF. And for LST, it will be sampled LST Geo data frame. So let's go ahead and run that. It's done. So a quick look at the sampled NDVI. So for each grid, we have uh, some NDVI here. Now you take note here that by default, it's, it calls the column mean, and we'll have to change that going forward. So we do the same. So have a look at the first uh, five rows for the sampled LST geodata frame. And also we have the temperatures here. And it also um, by default gave it the name or column name mean. So we will now put these uh, values, extracted values, back into our grids, our main grids um, data frame. So we create a column in the grids called NDVI. Now we say um, sample NDVI with subsets and pick the column mean because that is what we are interested in. And then we round it to two decimal places to keep it uh, nice and simple. We will do the same LST for the grids, the new column grids LST. Now we will take the mean column from the sampled LST geodata frame and also round it to two decimal places. And these are simple um, pandas or geo pandas um, operations. So let's have a look at how our grades look like now. So now for our grades, we have the grid IDs, the geometry, the NDVI and then the LST. Before then, we just had two columns for the grids. That's the grid and its geometry. But now for each grid, we have the NDVI and also the LST. But our job here is, is not done because most people want to see maps and not a data frame. So before we proceed to make the maps, the 
Now such images come in the UTM reference system and our grids were also in the UTM reference system. But we would want to convert that to the local coordinate system, that is the EPSG 3301 or the Estonian coordinate reference system. So to do that, we would use the to CRS method, which is coming from GeoPandas. So the, we reassign or we define our grids and say our new grids is the grids we already have to this CRS. And we just have to pass the EPSG code of the intended or our destination CRS to the method. So I'll go ahead and run that. And that is done. So now let us take a quick look at our grid data, our final grid data. So we have everything in place. We have our NDVI, we have our LST. We've not lost any geometry information, at least hopefully. And we also have our IDs. So now we can go ahead and visualize our final output. And we'll do that with um, matplotlib. So we first um, create a matplotlib figure with two axes. So I say um, PLT because we imported matplotlib as PLT. And then I want two subplots with one row and then two columns. And then I also define the size of the figure, how the plot should, how big the plot should be, and also um, display quality. You can use any value of your choice, but I think anything above 300 is okay. So now I'll flatten the axis so I can access each subplot. So I say AX1, and then AX2 as axis dots flatten. So this axis here, I just um, flatten it to get the individual subplot. So now I start with the plot. So I have AX2 because I want to plot um, the land surface temperature as on the second plot. Um, it is not so nice because ideally one should come before two, but nothing, nothing changes in this, in this way. So I have AX2 and I say grid.plot LST. So I define the column because I have to tell um, the, the plotting function or the geopandas plot function that you are plotting the grids, but take your values from this column LST. And then I say use the C map as LST C map. And then do the plotting or put the plot in AX2 from the figure. Then I want a legend and I want to shrink the legend. Uh, in relation to the general plot by a factor of 0 0.7. So this does the plot. However, um, as we saw earlier, you would sometimes get the scientific notation on one of the axes, which we do not want. So I say AX to the tick label format, I want them as plain numbers. I know scientific notations. Also for the legend, I say um, the parameter size or the label size should be eight. And then in this line, I set the title of the plot. Now do a similar thing for the NDVI here. I put define a variable, a plot variable, and then call the plots that say take the data from the column NDVI and use the NDVI C map I defined earlier. 
and then use AX1 as the access. I also want the legend, so the legend argument must be true. And then shrink the legend in relation to the plot by a factor of 0 0.7. And then apply the same um, tweaks to avoid the scientific notation on the axis and also keep the labels for the legend at eight and set the title to NDVR. Now I can export this uh, plot directly from Jupyter Notebook. So I say PLT, save the figure. I pass the figure name with an extension and also say DPI output 600, it could be 300 for you. Then I don't want any um, transparent image. So I set a transparency or transparent argument to false. And I also don't want any frame around the entire plot. So I say frame is important now. So let's run this. This might take a while. Okay, so now we have our plot. So even though I started with AX2 and followed with AX1, it's in the same order, AX1, AX2. So I have my NDVI here to the steady area and also the land surface temperature, also to the steady area. So with this, suppose you want to move to Tallinn and find um, a green neighborhood to live in, you can have an idea of which areas are green within the, within the city. And also if you want to avoid the hot spots in Tallinn, especially during a heat wave, you can also pick uh, an area to live at. But mind you, the most green and the most coolest places, you may not get the license to, to live there. So you would have to live within the city. You can't also live here. All right. So now your, your client or your boss would want um, some raster file to work with. And um, the maps will not be enough the maps will just to show what you have. So we would want to export our data as a raster file, but we have two parameters, NDVI and then land surface temperature. We could export them individually and then have um, two files, but we can also export one file that has both parameters and uh, this is coming from the concept of data cubes. So we'll use the GeoCube library, which I said is already built on um, raster IO. So if we were using raster IO, we would have to define the meta parameters we saw in the stack, the uh, find the, the limits, the resolution, and the coordinate system. So that would be some extra lines of code. But with GeoCube, you can just do that in just two lines of code. You first make the cube and you pass your vector data, which is the grids, and then the resolution of your grids, that is 1,000 by 1,000. If we were using um, raster IO, since we are doing the export from a vector file or a GeoData frame, would need a template raster for raster IO to look at and also do that. But with GeoCube, you can do it directly because this um, template raster stuff is done in the um, back end for you. So all you need is the grids and also the resolution. So after you create your cube, then you say cube.rio to raster and then you provide um, a name for it. So essentially your output will be one GeoTIFF file 
with two bands in there. So let's run that. Cool. So you have your file in your, if you downloaded this notebook and you already have the libraries, you would have that in your local folder. And then you can have a quick look at that. So I would stop sharing my screen now and set up a QGIS and we can look at the final output in my local folder. So stop sharing now. And I'll also take the opportunity to answer some of the questions that um, came in. Okay, so Tavi, you have one error 500. Can you kindly, okay, that is sorted, great. Okay, so we have a question. Um, why do coastal areas have NDVI, lower NDVI than rest of the sea? Well, essentially the, um, there's no vegetation on the sea for, for starters. And these um, coastal areas, most of these places have a, a protected sites. So you have a lot of um, forests along the coast. Now, Isaac, I mean, uh, in the water, okay. that the water had uh, in the coastal areas, there was lower NDVI than uh, the rest of the sea, than mean inland. Um, let's go back to the workshop. So I would assume actually the other way around, but. Okay, I, we can always go back to the... Yeah, here, as you see that the sea around, like really coastal, close to the coast, and, yeah. the, and the lake, Ulam is the lake, has also lower value than the sea, uh, the sea, or the sea has uh, just some bloom, algae bloom or something, and the coastal area yes, doesn't... And then also, um, if you look to the... Okay, which is uh, the fox composite, the sea is um, dark, but then you could see some haze over the um, sea, so which actually affects the, the value of the NDVI. And also water bodies have um, different um, responses. So it, it, it could be really interesting to assess um, NDVI because uh, it depends on the flora and fauna activities in the, in the water body. So freshwater may have a different response compared to sea or ocean water. Yeah, but thanks for bringing that up. And uh, there was one more comment. So I'll stop sharing now before we go back to. Okay, so Paolo is asking for some link um, to tutorials to dig deeper into Python for remote sensing. Um, Paolo, I'll drop a link to the landscape geoinformatics um, lab, where you can get some resources from some of the courses they gave for Python and remote sensing and also Python and 
Joe Pandas. So before we end this workshop, I will provide a link to that, Paulo. All right, so it looks like we are set to have a look at what we have in QGIS. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, so this is what I have from my local run here. And let's see. So I go to properties and then I say I want a single bun, say zero color. And now I see here I have um, both parameters. So bank one as the NDVI and also bank two as the LST. So let's pick um, the LST and then set our minimum to 15 and then max to say 40. And then let's just apply. So this is what we have here. Colors are not so nice here. But essentially you can see the uh, cooler areas, which is the Lake Ola Miste here. And also the, uh, okay, sorry. Let me invert the color up. So now it makes more sense. You have your warmer areas um, around red, and then your cooler areas blue. Uh, let's do some tweaking here. Set this to 35. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now it's more like what we saw. I mean, we can also do the same for the NDVI. So you would go back to properties and switch to the NDVI. And in this case, we will change our max to one and then negative 0 0.2, say. And also change to a meaningful um, color. So let's just use uh, the greens. And here we go. So I think this brings us to the end of this uh, workshop. But before we go, I'll just stop sharing my screen. And then as I promised, provide the link to the landscape geoinformatics. Um, lab at the University of Tartu. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, there's one question that says: Is there any specific reason we use min and max value fifteen and forty? Effectively for band rendering. Yeah, so as I said, um, these values usually comes from uh, expert knowledge. So if you don't know what a potential uh, maximum land surface temperature in the area could be, you could leave those um, arguments out of the plot, and then your EP dot plot will do the um, scaling for you. But as I said, I've been doing this for some time now. So I have uh, an idea of what the maximum should be. I, it doesn't really go beyond 40 degrees Celsius out here in Estonia. And also in the summer, I think 15 on the lower side is um, practical. But you, you, you shouldn't be tied to these um, um, values. You can explore for yourself and do your um, scaling. All right, so the landscape um, geoinformatics website or link to the website or web pages in the chat. And over there, you can get some more information on latest um, scientific publications from the lab 
and um, info on events like this. Um, be sure to follow the lab also on Twitter to get the um, latest feed. And I'll also put the Twitter handle in the, in the chats. So follow at Landscape Geoinformatics for the latest or the 411 in Geoinformatics at the University of Tartu and also check out the link for courses and materials. Thanks for joining. It's been a pleasure taking you through this process. I'll hand over to Alex now. Thanks very much, Isaac. Well done. Um, you put a lot of effort into this and uh, the notebook is great and the resources great to see. Um, I hope everybody en enjoyed uh, the session and maybe also learned something new. And um, if there's no other questions, then I think Isaac said it all. We would of course love to you know, have you around. Um, we will do another session um, next week uh, on uh, more climate related data. So make sure you follow up to the meetup group or the Facebook group or our landscape geoinformatics Twitter feed where it will be announced. Um, with that, I would then conclude the session and um, thanks very much everybody. And um, maybe see you another time. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye, everybody. See you.